Welcome back to another lesson on exponential functions. If you remember the first couple lessons in this series, we introduced the scale factor of an exponential function. y equals a times b to the x. The scale factor is a. Today we are going to re-examine this scale factor and connect it to the logarithm, which was defined as the inverse of an exponential function. To quickly recap from the last lesson, we know that any base b1 to the c times x can be rewritten as another base b to the x. c is a constant. Using laws of logarithms, it turns out that the constant c is the natural log of base b. Technically, it is the natural log if we choose base b1 equal to e, approximately 2.718. While it may not be immediately intuitive if your background with exponentials is not extensive, this happens to be a very convenient choice of base for a variety of reasons. So we will use e. These are the laws of exponents we used in the previous slide. Refer to the lesson dedicated to this topic if you want more details about these laws. So now I want to explore what happens when we take the derivative of e to the cx. Remember from calculus that the derivative is the slope of a function. This function is quite simple to differentiate, but to be thorough we should use the chain rule. Given u a function of x and f a function of u, the chain rule states what is seen in the top line df du is the derivative of the outside function, and du dx is the derivative of the inside function. You'll see what I mean with a specific example. For e to the cx, we have two functions. f of u is e to the u. This is the outside function. u of x is c times x. This is the inside function. df du equals e to the u. We already demonstrated in an earlier lesson why this function is equal to its own derivative. du dx equals the constant c by the power rule of differentiation. So now we just plug it all in. The derivative with respect to x of e to the cx equals c times e to the cx. That's simple enough and can be found in virtually any calculus textbook. The chain rule may have seemed like overkill, but this approach I just walked us through will make breaking down other, more complicated problems a whole lot easier. Again, this is the result we just found using the chain rule of differentiation from calculus. But we just saw that e to the cx can be rewritten as a different base b to the x, and the constant c was shown to be equal to the natural log of b. So that means the derivative of b to the x equals the natural log of b times b to the x. So it is that the derivative of any exponential function is equal to itself times some constant. If the base b is equal to e, then this constant is one. The natural log of e is one by definition. This can be seen on the page containing laws of logarithms. We have already seen various reasons why this property is incredibly useful. If you remember from an early lesson in this series, we found the derivative of b to the x using secant lines. That gave us the limit boxed in red. This is some constant we call a. So this limit is really a scale factor. For those who have forgotten, here is a visual of the secant line approximation of the derivative. The green is the secant line, and the red is the actual derivative, or slope, that we want. Notice that the slopes of the two lines are nearly parallel. This central difference is basically defining slope f prime of x as delta y over delta x, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is from middle school algebra. Here the notation is just a bit different. f of x plus h minus f of x minus h all over 2h. This page just shows the algebraic steps we took to get the result, which is summarized from a separate lesson that describes this more thoroughly. It involves laws of exponents and pulling b to the x out front at the end. That can be done as long as we keep all the h's inside the limit. 
So the main punchline here is that the natural log of b is equal to the limit definition of the derivative. That result is boxed in green. All this comes from the scale factor a multiplied by an exponential b to the x. You'll remember from that same lesson just mentioned that we computed this result. Instead of zero, we let h equal 0.1. The tenth root of two gives us a good start. The final answer is 0.693. This happens to equal the natural log of two rounded to three digits past the decimal. Huh, so it seems like this limit definition is an alternate way to compute the natural log of a number b. Mind you, it isn't as good as the series expansion on the next slide. This series expansion for the natural log of a number was derived using the geometric series. Here I've repeated it for convenient reference. In order to speed up convergence, we used the square root of two as the input, which gave us the number underlined in green for x. Smaller x values converge more rapidly. That value was used in the series expansion, as seen here. Notice the last row of the third and fourth columns. We have converged to 15 digits past the decimal. Then we use laws of logarithms to find the natural log of two, which is underlined in blue. Notice the first three digits are 0.693. That was the value we got from the limit definition. Remember from the same lesson, we also found the derivative of y equals three to the x. Using the limit definition, this scale factor was computed as approximately 1.101. How does that compare to the natural log of three using the series expansion? They should be pretty close. Why don't you find out for yourself using the techniques we've shown here? Let us know in the comment section below if you stumble upon any noteworthy discoveries. I appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you again in another lesson. Thanks for watching. Thank you.